Sometimes we convince ourselves that right now isn't quite right. It's not the wrong time necessarily, but eh, soon. We'll have that thing that will make the perfect launch point soon. So we'll wait. You hear it a lot with hopeful creators, right? As soon as I get the camera, I'm going to start the podcast. As soon as I feel inspired, I'll start writing. Or how about this one we can all relate to in some way. As soon as it's January 1, I'll start taking care of myself and my health. And I'm not talking about this because I read about it. I'm talking about it because I live it. It's an adversary I'm always up against. The allure of waiting for that perfect moment. But here's the deal. When you start now, The imperfections become part of the value. People see imperfections and become inspired by them. He started getting in shape in his garage with two dumbbells. Look at that. She started writing her novel in a notebook, waiting to pick her kids up from school. Going now not only destroys that enemy that is procrastination, it also gives you something of value in return. It lets the very fact that you found a way become a narrative in your story. It allows your imperfections to become your greatness. I recently relocated my studio to Scottsdale, a move that, according to the moving company, would take seven to 10 days. 24 days later, I realized that there are places in life where you can attempt to cut costs. Moving companies should never be one of those things. I found myself with the recording equipment in my camera bag that I travel with and some empty boxes. I'm waiting for my stuff to show up one week, two weeks, three weeks. Soon, soon it'll arrive. And I'll be able to record then. Because right now there's no lighting. Right now I don't have my tripod. I don't have anything to, you know, put behind me in the set. It's like, wait, wait, wait. Or how about this? You take the empty shelves and you make them intentional. You lean boxes against the wall. You have a life transition set, right? And not only can you make that work, not only will it look sufficient, but it's like you have a story now. We like to hear about the times others made something out of an apparent nothing. It's relatable. And that's actually where the fun stuff is in in any conversation. I'm recording this in a hotel room. Doing what I can with what I have. And so when you find yourself feeling not quite ready and the temptation is to wait Rather than hold out hope for a fake perfection that never comes, why not unpack the beauty contained in the present moment? Or put a much more practical way, the opportunity contained in the present moment. Why not begin with less and tap into something that no other time in your life will have but now? Start your podcast using your phone. Mediocre visuals and echoey audio. Let this be the beginning that you look back on and and smile. Remember how fun those episodes were? That mediocre at best equipment and stories about where we were in life? Start working out now. Can't get to the gym? Do it in your garage, in your living room. Then you can point you know, to to where it would have been easy not to, but you built your physical foundation on the third floor of an apartment building in New York. People ask you, you know, what it took to get into the shape you're in now? Wait in a floor, just start. I find repeatedly that it's not about perfect. 
It's about who we become in making progress with far less than the perfect we'd hoped for. That's what makes you realize, you know, how much of what we tell ourselves is just rationalization. We're scared to not look good. That's all. We're scared of new things, worried about beginning. And so we convince ourselves that the camera angle will make all the difference. The expensive lens will be the differentiator. Again, I've lived this. And then you get it, and it's like, in truth, the new camera just sits there. You're still the person in front of it. And what you say in front of your phone versus a $2,000 Sony is still entirely dependent on you. Surprise. Like the Sony doesn't have much say. And so I call you to think less about the set and more about what's going on within it. The amount you can do with what you have now will astound you. How little we need is truly magical. You know, in these last three weeks have emphasized that for me. Two pairs of shoes, two pairs of jeans, some t-shirts, and a camera. I didn't miss much. Because my ability to think and share ideas didn't get packed away and put in the truck with everything else. That stayed with me. And we all have some version of that in our own lives. That's what matters. You are LeBron at something. So cherish that. Bring that to the world, regardless of the circumstances. You can put LeBron on a broken down court with no nets, he'd still be pretty good. The environment becomes something different, something enjoyable because of its novelty. Too often we miss the value, you know, because of the details. So, I'll end with this. Don't seek perfection. Seek to start now with what you have so that you can give more of yourself to the world. You can give more of yourself when you're unsure. Give more of yourself when you're lost. Give more of yourself when you're starting. Give more of yourself when you don't have all the tools you wish you had. Give more of yourself at the beginning, give more at the middle, and at the end. Anything that suggests you need some miracle in the mail before you can begin or tap into what matters is fear. It's nothing more and nothing less. So start. Start for the world and for the story you'll be able to share by simply initiating the climb. We spend a lot of time and we exhaust a lot of effort looking for that so-called edge. Capturing the little changes or advantages that add value and ultimately push us closer to where we want to be. Right? These so-called life hacks are everywhere. From, you name it, reshuffling daily tasks to activities, you know, exercises that enhance our performance, food, supplements, apps. The list goes on and on and I'm speaking broadly here intentionally because that quote-unquote edge could mean a million different things to a million different people. Obviously, tremendous value there in finding ways to become better, faster, and stronger. But why this topic excites me and, and what I'm specifically looking forward to exploring is what I believe to be the most important advantage there is, and that's consistency. Consistency, the unsexy, unremarkable answer, right? But you can always distill everything else down into that simple art of showing up, being there every day. To me, that begins it all. That will always be the foundation we build everything on. Over time, it becomes the reason you win 
or you lose. And I believe that wholeheartedly. Like nothing matters if you aren't locked in and repeatedly making the daily effort. No pill is gonna make you a starting point guard or a stellar performer at work or, you know, an amazing parent. That's dedicated, concentrated, consistent effort. A metaphor I like that demonstrates this process to me is trying to get fit, right? Whether you run or go to the gym, whatever it is, it's much easier to stay home and take creatine, protein, supplements, than to actually show up to the gym every day, than to actually put in the miles every day, right? But without showing up, all that other stuff is meaningless. And that's the heart of what I'm getting at. It's the lifting that's transformative. Everything else is supplemental. It's even in the term, right? Supplements. Now, is this obvious? Sure. But man, do we forget the obvious, and there is a hefty price for doing so. It's like, yeah, we should look for advantages along the way. And this becomes more and more relevant uh, you know, the longer we've been immersed in the process, those little details mean more and more, but they never mean more than having a goal and committing to it every single day. Never forget that. Showing up is power. There's a few quotes I like um, by James Clear, who's considered by many to be an expert on habit building that hammer down on the power of consistency. And, uh, he says, improving by 1% isn't particularly notable. Sometimes it isn't even noticeable, but it can be far more meaningful, especially in the long run. Right? He goes on to say, if you can get 1% better each day for one year, you'll end up being 37 times better by the time you're done. And I think that's what gets me, right? That line, 1% better every day means 37 times better in a year. Nothing can replicate that. There are no shortcuts to arrive at that type of progress or growth, none. And sure, the environment can change. There are times where the landscape shifts right under your feet. You have to reach further outside your comfort zone than you ever have. But that's still a product of your commitment to improve every single day. The context changes, the details change, but you still show up. 1% is essentially a rhythm, it's automated. It says, just like breathing air and drinking water, this is what I do, a dollar in the bank every day. What you're doing is giving life to a compound effect that will change everything. In my world, my showing up is every day, how do I become a little bit better at storytelling? How do I refine that intersection of personal development and entertainment? So that, you know, we can uh, enjoy and get the most out of the journey. How do I make this brand matter a little more, mean a little more, be a little more effective? That's my Super Bowl, every day. And funny story, I was driving this morning, listening to a podcast about AI. Right, everyone seems to be talking about AI right now, and for good reason. I heard one of the guests say that in 10 years, there will be two types of businesses. Those that successfully leverage AI and those that failed and are no longer in existence. Right, it's a hypothesis, obviously, but it's eye-opening. Right? AI is going to change everything. And I had to check my initial instinct that was Honestly, oh, here we go, right? Another way for people to cut corners and cheat. And I, I had to pause and think about it. Like, that's just a terrible way uh, to look at a new technology. That's a scarcity mindset. Instead, think about the opportunity. Remind yourself that you show up every day with the same mission and the same goal. You'll earn that 1% every day. And this is just another supplement to your growth. Right, utilized correctly, at least in the current moment, this is whey protein or creatine for your lifting at the gym. So leverage it, right? That's all. Same with any new technology. And there was comfort there. 
There was comfort in looking back at thinking, look at all the previous technology, its evolution. Look at the social platforms, how we interact now. Through it all, the changes, the highs, lows, ups and downs, you showed up. You held on to that North Star and over and over again made necessary adjustments. Right? That commitment has been everything. YouTube's algorithm changes did not kill me. It ended up making me a better storyteller, writer, speaker. COVID, you know, pushing my live speaking engagements aside for a while, causing me to further digitize my business model, that didn't hurt me. It made the brand bigger. Short form content, blasting off onto the scene, TikToks, IG Reels, that didn't hurt me. It forced me to be smarter and more thoughtful about how to integrate short term content into my long form content, how to make them work together. It ended up being an advantage. Right? The bottom line being, when you are consistent, when you show up for your thing, no matter what, no matter what changes are occurring, no matter what's happening externally, when you're there for your mission, that allows you to make whatever little changes need to be made along the way. Being there for yourself, committing to the twists and turns is everything. And it may be extreme to say, especially in such a rapidly changing environment right now, but my mentality is, who cares? Who cares about all the detail and the minutia and the externality? Who cares? You know what matters. You know what you're here to do. So keep that front and center. Simplicity being the ultimate sophistication doesn't get simpler, show up. Never let that 1% that James Clear talks about out of your sight. And then make the adjustments as necessary. Integrate the life hacks and the tech evolutions. Right, Fighting for that 1% every single day becomes 37 times better in a year. Think about how powerful that is. Let the world argue over this and that. Let them be on this path versus that path. Your strength is in trusting yourself to adjust along the way. But knowing that through it all, you will be there every morning when the sun comes up, the light moves through your window. You'll wake up committed to being a little better than you were yesterday. And that's why through it all, the turbulence, the highs, the lows, the ups and the downs, you will still be standing there ready for whatever comes next. Today is not like any day I've lived before. And why should it be? This very second, there are roads to be explored that I've never before walked down. There are actions to take that I've never before taken and ideas to bring to life that I've never before given the respect they deserve. That saying, my golden rule, you are always one decision away from a totally different life. You are always one realization from pulling the lever, opening the door, finding the answer you've been walking by all your life. The problem is you don't see today as today. You see it as a continuation of yesterday. The same movie with the same characters and same rules. Without even realizing you need to change the script. Emerson said, write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. Why? Because it can be. Your job is to remember that things will continue on and on and on until we give them an end. 
We must manually close the book on yesterday's story and start anew. Because we can. We often don't realize, but we can. And that is why the morning, each new day, is so precious. It's taking the mistakes and sometimes disappointments of yesterday and transforming them into today's lessons and the opportunity to begin again. A new journey seen through a new lens, walked through a new pair of shoes, a new sense of self. So here is your reminder that the words were and are, they're very different. That's why each sunrise transcribes into the sky the hopes and dreams of the you that you've always wanted to be. It's not a crazy formula or some secret code. It's simply untying your boat from the harbor that is yesterday and moving towards tomorrow's horizon. How much did you care? What do you mean? I didn't understand the question at first. In that room, how much did you care what they thought of you? Like if zero is not at all and 10 is you cared a lot, how much did you care? Hmm, eight, I said, probably around an eight out of 10. And that is the problem. Because if you care, you are not free. I've been working my whole life to obtain that word in its truest sense, freedom. And I made progress. The world around us is tough to change, but most things worth changing are tough. I've uprooted and walked away from people that brought me down plenty of times. I've walked away from places that just weren't me. I've committed to carving out a path that I deem meaningful in my life. See, but you can always turn your back and walk away from people, from places, from situations. Here's a little caveat no one seems to tell you about, though. You have to take yourself with you. There's no destination to which you can arrive without your thoughts. There's no place you can show up without your narratives or your view of the world. And the more I navigate this floating rock we're on, the more I'm convinced that weather is determined by the onlooker, not the atmosphere. Some people simply choose to see sun. Some people choose rain. Our forecasts are internal. I've referenced this book often because it's one of the few cheat codes, not to any subset of reality, but to life in general that allows us to reverse engineer true contentment. It's called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying by Bronnie Ware where she speaks with mostly older people during their final days, asks them what they would do differently if they could do it all over again. Regret number one, and we can actually stop right there, is I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the one others expected of me. Meaning the number one thing people wish they did differently was careless. They wished they'd lived in their authenticity, put more weight on their goals and their dreams than those of strangers that pass like ships in the night. Every time we repress who we are, our future selves shed a tear. And I know that's not pretty or uplifting to think about, right? A future you looking down and wishing you'd sought out that freedom in its truest form, the freedom to live fully. 
But look, sometimes carving meaning out of life just isn't pretty. Sometimes what's necessary is not pretty. See, everything's relative. And perhaps understanding that it's not others who are the judge, but it's instead that older version of you sitting on the bedside, reflecting back on this one roller coaster ride. Maybe that's who we're living for. That's the well from which our courage should be drawn. We are guests passing through a miracle with minds that falsely and irresponsibly whisper, we have all the time in the world, trying to convince us that the trip lasts forever. But it doesn't. Your life is a raindrop in a thunderstorm. It will be over as fast as it arrived, and how you choose to live it will be everything. See, there will always, in some capacity, exist that voice asking you to dial it down. There will, from time to time, be sweaty palms and shaking knees. You know, those human things. But when you find yourself standing on the edge of that door, looking out at a world that you know calls your name, let your voice be louder than all of it. Let the beating of your heart be stronger than your fear. And if you can't do it for you, then please do it for that version of you years from now, looking out the window, smiling about how you almost said no. You almost boxed yourself in. You almost let what matters pass you by. But instead, you captured life like a child chasing down a firefly that in a world of constraint, you allowed yourself to be free. Why is it that when we look back on our lives, it's never the easy days or the simplicity. It's not the calm that changes our reality or makes us who we are. Don't get me wrong, calm and simplicity, they're wonderful, but they're not transformative. And why would they be? Why would we change or seek to obtain more without a reason or incentive? It's times of struggle, of turbulence, it's when life was hard that we had to rethink who we are, reshape the way we look at the world. Right? Because without chaos, you don't get calm. Without the storm, you don't get those crazy neon colors and golden rays it leaves as it passes by. In order to triumph in any capacity or any area of life, there's always a sacrifice that must be made. The adversity is the fire that forges the iron. There's a saying, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. It's a, uh, a cycle. And this is generally used in a socio-political sense, and I, I think in a lot of ways it applies today, but where I've really found it useful, where I've found value in it is at the personal level. Because what I've noticed is that growth also appears to have a cyclical nature. And when we're in a rough situation or overcoming an obstacle, we have to push, we fight, we grow. Sometimes without even realizing it, we achieve uh, a result and by default this transformation that in one way or another makes us something new. But then it becomes easy to level out. Right, and that's the challenge. It creates this period of stagnation. It's like we made the jump and it becomes real easy to stay there. And that's why I have found value in when life is not providing resistance to manufacture some. Because that's the only way to grow. Progress is happiness. Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, you know, he says purpose is to find from struggle. 
If things are too calm or simple or quiet, life begins to lack meaning, and that's never a spot we want to be. Life is about the pursuit of something. You just have to figure out what that blank will be. You get to decide which mountain to climb. There's a story about a butterfly making its way out of a cocoon, and it makes a little hole. It starts attempting to push its way out. Someone walks by, they see it struggling, and open the cocoon up to help the butterfly out, right? Thinking that they did this great deed, but in doing so, that butterfly has now lost its ability to use its wings to fly. Why? Because the strength that was necessary to fly would have been forged when he fought his way out. The butterfly was deprived of the very thing it needed to become something more, and that's the point. It's easy to get lost in the now and seek to eliminate everything that doesn't make uh, the moment more comfortable, to remove that which doesn't make things easier. But whether we're talking about collectively or the complacency uh, in our individual lives, we have to remember that avoiding discomfort isn't the answer. When your biggest problem is Amazon taking five days to deliver, or that your feelings are hurt by someone's comments or opinions on social media, you've lost track of yourself. You may be living in a world lacking the resistance necessary for growth. Maybe it's time to ask what matters. And I remember when I lived in Boston, I'd walk around listening to podcasts downtown, and I'll never forget here Ryan Holiday differentiating between passion and purpose. He called passion temporary, a dopamine hit. It's the excitement before the project begins, the beginning of a journey, the honeymoon phase. But passion alone falls short. And it falls short because anything worthwhile is hard. It tests us. It repeatedly presents us with those metaphorical cocoons we have to fight. We have to earn our stripes, grow our wings, and if we stop at passion, there's no reason to battle on, to take the punches, knowing that they will create for us a tomorrow full of infinite possibility, and that's where we need purpose. That's why it matters. We need something bigger to march towards, a destination that's meaningful. To remind us that those challenging times, they're not a burden. There is no poor me here. They're the fire that sharpens us, that whispers to us not only the importance of carrying on, but the power contained within ourselves to do so. This world, it is not stacked against you. It's never the problem or the obstacle. No, it's the opportunity laid out at your feet. And it's in those very times when we're uncomfortable, when we're unsure, when we don't know where to draw our strength, that we need to remember it comes within. It's an idea that is brought to life through courage, through understanding, through the trials and tribulations of life that didn't intimidate or hold you back, knowing that life has given you everything you need to blaze your trail. So don't be afraid to let it take you somewhere new. There's something to the idea or act of stepping out of the limelight to work on yourself. To quote unquote, disappear for a particular period of time so that with a laser-like focus, you're able to build and develop the skills that will make you great at what it is you want to do. In a sense, we're not created out in the world as much as we're created by what we do behind the scenes. The thousands of hours spent 
dedicating ourselves to a craft, right? We enhance our value and capability by doing the often monotonous, unglamorous things day in and day out. And those results out in the world are merely a reflection of that work. And that's what makes excelling in any given area so challenging. There's something uh, counterintuitive about performing to an audience of one. Dancing to no applause, exhausting time and energy, resources, uh, so that you can cling to a promise. But that's also why excellence will always be reserved for a few. Open to everyone. But ultimately, a few end up there, right? The same way a finish line is open to everyone, but ultimately reserved only for those willing to put in the hundreds, if not thousands of practice miles to start the race, run the race, and complete the race. There's a substantial amount of sacrifice involved. The outside world is, is its own chess game. It requires courage and innovation and, and a willingness to step into its great unknown. But ideally, in doing so, one would be armed with uh, the competency they've acquired when no one is looking. It's a result of their own dedication and commitment. And I actually started thinking about this uh, during a Q&A I did recently, where someone asked if I had any thoughts on uh, how they could start a speaking career, right? I'm like, sure, happy to give my thoughts. First and foremost, uh, understand it's a long play. So be willing to endure that bumpy road, that journey. There's no magic formula that makes you an MLK-esque order overnight, right? You, you work forever to capture uh, a fragment of that excellence. And someone... Uh, kind of chimed in, giving me a hard time. You know, we know, we know, Eddie, you hate marketing. And I'm like, marketing? It took me a second to connect the dots. How is this related? Um, and the light bulb went off, and I kind of laughed because I do bash marketing quite a bit. And I think what they were getting to is I'm always talking about the long game, right? I'm always talking about working on yourself, the back end, the deep work, chiseling yourself into something that's uh, unique, authentically you, extraordinary in its own right. Or being so good, as the saying goes, they can't ignore you. Uh, but at the same time, it would be pretty ridiculous uh, and, and stupid for me to say marketing is not important. Marketing's pivotal, ingrained in some capacity in everything we touch. You have to be able to effectively communicate why something is valuable, obviously. But I think there is a misconception and genuine misunderstanding in today's day and age with regard to adding value, with regard to rising to the top of a niche or making an impact. You know, we see flashy posts and ads and videos and think, ah, that's the target. But that's just the mechanism for communication. That's the bullhorn. That's not the value add. In Cal Newport's deep work, he mentions how difficult it's becoming for us to break away from the social media and the push notifications and the emails and in solitude do the kind of work that really moves the needle, that propels our greatness and makes us better at what it is we're looking to be great at. We officially exist in a world of distraction, where perhaps the greatest challenge now is how do we disconnect? How do we turn off? How do we slip into a state of deep work so that we can grow as people? And then sure, you market that competency once it's acquired. But the goal is not to be a society screaming into a void trying to sell boxes of air. We simply can't afford to leave substance behind. Value is ultimately what makes the world go round and it's created, again, outside of the limelight. 
And look, there's going to be some bias to my approach based on the path that I chose to take. This has worked for me, so I stand by it. I advocate for it. And uh, surely there are some very talented people that disagree with me, and that's great. But I've always had the arrow pointed at what I want to do, what I want all this to mean at 45 years old, 55 years old. And right now, looking back, it's all the hours I spent writing in solitude or giving speeches to a wall in a studio apartment, recording and re-recording, adjusting my approach. It's reps, reps, reps. That, to me, is what matters now. That's what I'm most thankful for. And some time has passed, and as I transition into a new phase now, sure, I can get help and start blasting posts all over social media. That's easy. But the important thing is that I have a foundation to stand on. The posts are not the product. The craft is the product. And I want everyone to at least, whether they agree with me or not, understand that distinction. The million dollar question, the differentiator is, what is your value add? If you can ask yourself that, right? What is the one thing I want to be the best in the world at? Where is my North Star? And then spend every day, at least some time every day, chipping away at that. You'll be unstoppable. But truly chipping away. Not feeling the need to share every detail with an audience or capture every second of what you're building behind the scenes. No, turn the cameras off, breathe, focus. Be private for at least a portion of your day. I think you'll find in that space this beautiful opportunity to reflect and build and step into an evolved version of yourself. Don't be scared to disappear and come back better equipped. Don't be hesitant to go work on yourself. If you're talking substantive impact, true value add, it's always the people willing to put in the hours to do the things that most people are not willing to do, target, identify the areas that make the difference and then hammer those repeatedly. And look, I get it. You have to, in a lot of cases, uh, give up some of the now in order to reach an ambitious goal in the future. It's a trade-off, it's hard. But life is about trade-offs. And maybe this message isn't for everyone, but if you're listening to this and you want to achieve some semblance of excellence in a given area, it's inescapable. It means falling in love with a pursuit that's time intensive. It means showing up and putting in the hours often for little short-term validation. It means solitude because getting better is more important than attention. One of my favorite quotes is, confidence is earned. Well, you earn that confidence by showing up and committing to the things that truly matter, that make you stronger. Sometimes we must step back to leap forward, disappear as we are in order to reappear as we wish to be, Real work happens when no one is around you. Can you trust yourself enough to bet on that process? Believe in that road, in that journey. If yes, you'll position yourself for opportunities and experiences that exceed your wildest imagination. I've always been amazed at how much life can change with a small perspective shift. You hear something the right way, maybe even something you've heard, you know, a thousand times, this time you just hear it differently, and suddenly the light bulb goes off. 
suddenly it all makes sense. I was talking to one of my friends recently about how he threw discus in high school, and he was incredible at the sport. But for, you know, a long stretch, he was inconsistent with his release. And coach after coach after coach would try and help him with it. But it wasn't until one said to him, hey, instead of sprinting to the release, think of it as a scissor motion. Right now, I don't know much about discus, uh, but for whatever reason, that clicked for him. The gear started turning, he went to states. Had the best performance of his life. All because he looked at the same situation through a different lens. He found clarity in what was around him. Now you might be thinking, what does that have to do with me? Well, I'm of the thinking that in our own lives, right, the battles we are all individually fighting, the struggles we are going through, you know, amidst that storm, we are uh, one little light bulb moment from the clarity we need to re-engage, to create momentum. We're never as far from what we need as we think. But what we do is we convolute things. We tell ourselves that, you know, the, the, the change required is monumental. It's some larger-than-life transition. You look at my friend, the difference between a good season and an amazing season, it wasn't a year in the weight room away. No, it was a small mental shift. And even in your world, if the shift is just the beginning, great. Everything of substance does, in fact, have to start. And it's arriving at that point giving yourself the gift of clarity in a pursuit that becomes critical. I've always visualized that epiphany as me sitting in a dark room, pitch black, which is intimidating, it's intense, feels you know even helpless at times, but understanding there is always a light switch an arm's reach away. There's always the thing that will be transformative. We just have to keep reaching, keep stretching, keep feeling around for it because it exists. And with an outstretched arm, the very thing necessary to get us out of the dark and into the light is waiting. And that's just it. You know, we can't conflate the goal with the delta between where we stand now and the goal. No one can run a marathon in one giant step. It doesn't matter how strong you are, you're not leaping the course and diving through the finish tape. No, you're running thousands and thousands of little manageable steps. But we come face to face with situations in life where we know the finish line, whatever it is in your particular case, is way out there in the distance. And it's overwhelming, it's intimidating, it places us back in that dark room where we're surrounded by the unknown and inundated with stories we tell ourselves about how difficult life is. This is where you need to reach out and look for the light switch. It's where you need to remember you're not responsible for the finish line because how could you be? Humans are only capable of moving forward one step at a time. It's where you have to understand that the greatest impact on the discus right now is a change to your release point, a perspective shift, something minimal that gets you the distance. Every time I've been stuck or lost. It has been an adjustment to the way I'm looking at the world around me that's ultimately made the difference. A little reminder to take the pressure off. At least in the sense that we can only control what we can control. And usually that's the step right in front of us. So my suggestion 
is to stop looking up at the mountain and look down at the very next step. Because from where you stand, there is a path to get you there. But the process calls for you to, one, believe it's possible, and two, make the little adjustment in real time that will put you in position to do just that. You're never down and out. Not so long as there's air in your lungs and blood pumping through your veins, you are rather one decision away, one epiphany away, one flick of the light switch away from recapturing momentum and finding yourself again. You can be your greatest fan and also your biggest critic. In fact, not only is it healthy, it's necessary to be there for yourself, celebrate that commitment to show up, but also to hold yourself accountable for growth. Because to be great is to know there's more in you, to understand that there's greatness waiting to be extracted from the miracle that is you. Here are two words. I want to take a look at both of them. Consistency and adaptation. Consistency first. Why? Because consistency gets you in the door. It's the cost of admission. Consistency is you showing up for yourself. Day in and day out creating mastery and competence through repetition, manufacturing a a data set that will be used to guide your journey, taking a, a once stagnant idea and putting it into motion. Consistency is doing what you promised yourself you'd do when you said you'd do it. Why? Because that's who you are. You create goals and then conquer those goals. When your head hits the pillow at night, you may be tired. You may have struggled. You may have swung and missed. You may be wondering how things unfolded the way they did. But you showed up. So celebrate that. Celebrate yourself Be your biggest fan. Because the world can't take your will to step forward and cannot seize your consistency. Not without your permission. So other than part one, let's call consistency the commitment to show up for you. Now, the second piece. Consistency's older brother, adaptation. See, that consistency, like we just talked about, it will get you in the door. It signs you up for the game, but it guarantees nothing. See where consistency puts that pen in your hand, paper in front of you, pats you on the back, where consistency gives you a chance to write your story. One's level of success or achievement relies on their ability to adapt. To do the thing that's so hard for people to do, look in the mirror and ask, how can I be better? I've been consistent for 30 days, sure. Here's what's right, here's what's wrong. Now it's time to adjust, to be critical to understand that expecting more of the self does not in any way diminish the task at hand. 
It gives you room to expand into that next version of yourself in a way that simply showing up doesn't. Without a willingness to adapt, you get Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results. You get day after day of wondering why this square peg won't just save us all the trouble and go into the round hole. Without a willingness to adapt, we move for the sake of moving and we work for the sake of working. But if we could find it within ourselves to look at the data that's been acquired day after day and use it to help guide ourselves to that North Star, we'll find strength. To seek out the delta between where we are and where we want to be, that is power. But it calls for more than just showing up. It calls for looking around. It calls for observing and then adapting. So yeah, your greatest fan and your greatest critic. Be there for you, but don't let yourself get away with good enough. Showing up is critical. It's powerful, but it's just the beginning. If your eyes stay open, if you're willing to both love yourself and improve yourself simultaneously, all the world becomes available to you. There are no mountains you can't climb or oceans you can't cross. And sure, the world will do what the world does. It will place challenges before you. But rather than those challenges being the reason you can't, rather than accepting those challenges as a permanent reality, they become nothing more than the next puzzle to be solved, the next little adaptation that's required of you. You show up, you self-assess, you adjust, and carry right on towards that horizon again and again. So when you find yourself frustrated or up against that wall, remember you are building your ideal reality. Be proud of yourself for showing up, for being consistent. Because as dire as it might seem, you overcame a lot to get here. But also know that the challenge at hand is not an indictment of you or your goals. It's your chance to review the game plan and adjust. Your opportunity to do what so many fail to do, not shrink from the world, but adapt yourself to it, grow because of it. Today is your opportunity to take what the world gives you and build something new. Thoreau said that most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. Probably an astute observation, as most death is potential put to rest. Most stories were stories about what could have been. Perhaps simply because it's easier on the ego to talk about what life could have looked like if you cared enough to shape it than to have actually put skin in the game and fallen short. But there lies the misconception. To step into life's chaos with the hopes of taming it is why we're here. And yeah, obviously it hurts to fail. It hurts uh, to be vulnerable, to put yourself out there, especially when it seems as though all eyes are on you. But that hurt is a fraction of the hurt the road describes. Falling hurts, 
but it hurts less than wishing you had the courage to fall. Ridicule, it hurts. But it hurts less than being the one on the sidelines, pointing the finger and simultaneously longing for the courage to take action in their own life. What keeps us from going? What keeps us from building? We know life is short. We know regret is the ultimate pain. We know how much opportunity is out there. So why? Why would we not go? Why would we designate dreaming to sleep? In his famous Man in the Arena speech, Teddy Roosevelt said this, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. But who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. No one who is content in their own life will go out of their way to bring you down. There was never a critic deeply immersed in their own journey who took the time to mock or scoff at the man in the arena. I think our fear is pointed in the wrong direction. It shouldn't be concentrated on or focused on the opinions of those who have not yet themselves walked through those doors. No, the fear should be letting life go by without ourselves walking through. The fear should be contributing to Thoreau's statistic of quiet desperation, the one most men face but you are not most men or most women. Not because you were given some special power or status, but because you decided. You can choose not to be like most people. Basic math, taking into account the number of people in the stands versus the number of people on the stage or court or in the arena, well, it tells a tale of courage. Anyone can sit in the stands. Anyone can. Anyone can from the nosebleeds decide whether to clap or point or boo or cheer, but who suits up and enters the game? Who looks at the finitude of life and says, this is my reason to start building, to put it all on the line. Because if I fail, it will mean I was one of the few who looked around and said, this isn't bigger than I am. This world is not predefined. It's being built in real time by those willing to walk through the doors and step into the arena, not the critics, but the doers. And look, everyone has a thing, right? I don't know what that thing is for you, but you do. You probably think about it all the time, dream about it every day. You probably know it's where your heart is pulling you. Do not let your life become a statistic. Don't you dare go to that graveyard having been someone who held on tighter to excuses than to what mattered most in your life. So go.
step into the arena and if they point, let them point. If they criticize, let them criticize. Your concern isn't with those wishing they had the courage to step through those doors themselves. It's not about them, it's about you. It's about understanding the beauty and the opportunity and the freedom contained in life for those who find the courage to reach out and take it. Not too long ago, I shared a few thoughts related to Stoicism with uh, one of the most important messages in my eyes being, you can't always help how you feel. There are biological elements, there are emotions uh, that we as humans simply cannot escape. But what we have control over is how we act, right? What we do amidst the feelings of sadness or anger or despair. Well, as it happens, fate brought me face to face with that lesson once again. And one of the most interesting aspects of life is that the lessons often have to be relearned, right? As the context around us changes, we are forced to draw from that well, to take what we knew and transform it and level up. And so quick story, two weeks ago-ish, uh, my Facebook account was hacked which happens to a lot of people. It's not uncommon. And to be honest, I'd never really thought much about it. Uh, but I'm sitting there and I start getting these emails coming in, right? Telling me my phone number's changed, my email address has changed, my username's changed. All this stuff is, is changing. I'm like, what's going on? And, and before I could do anything, I go to look and realize I'm locked out of the account, right? Then I go from my personal page to my business page uh, where I share thoughts like these, these episodes, videos, writings, and uh, basically, you know, stuff I've been working on for years and I realize I'm locked out of there as well. So whoever has the account is now operating it and for whatever reason, posting like spammy images and videos, replying to people pretending to be me. And there's just nothing I could do, right? I'm just locked out watching this happen. And when I say I felt angry, it, it's probably an understatement. Uh, I was surprised at how furious I was. It was a rage that I wouldn't have anticipated in a million years. I could not help it. And, uh, you know, maybe it was vulnerability, right? That feeling of helplessness that some stranger had access to. Um, you know, around 100,000 people that trust me. Um, they had no idea what was happening, right? Or maybe it was anger at whoever it was doing this. Anger at Facebook for being non-responsive. Maybe a fear that, look, you can work so hard for so long and have something taken away incredibly quickly. Whatever it was, I was distraught for like three hours. And uh, eventually I calmed down a little bit. And I remember just sitting there being so disappointed in my reaction, right? I hated that I felt the way I did because leaders, and that's what I consider myself, that's what I aim to be in the world, they have to be more composed than I was, period. I thought about that story about uh, the ship at sea that was, it was trapped amidst the storm where everyone was terrified the ship's going to sink, people were pale, um, you know, just frantic, screaming, except for the professor who, although he felt the same fear and was overcome by the same biological characteristics, he was not crying out. Indicating that, you know, emotions often can't be avoided, but the response is what carries the weight. And I, I just think it was a, a great lesson for me because for a quick period of time, I definitely, using the same metaphor, cried out, right? And if that intrusion on my work and privacy was a ship amidst the storm, it's okay that I felt the way I did, but now we have to work on the reaction. 
And by the way, I've gotten plenty of opportunity to, right? The account's still hacked. There's still weird posts going out under my name, uh, but I manage it way differently. There's a, a calmness that I've managed to acquire and maintain. We're done complaining about problems here. We're looking for solutions amidst what we can control and letting go of what we cannot. Look, I know it's a cliche that our most important lessons come from our moments of duress, but this is exactly what I believe that phrase refers to, right? You need to be hardened by the adversity to change yourself. You need to be able to look in the mirror and go, ooh, I didn't like that. I'm not doing that again, right? And it took a, an embarrassing three hours of me being furious and acting irrationally. Um, okay, fine. But that's a small price to pay for the lesson that I acquired. So I think for someone listening to this, my hope is twofold. One, don't forget that the initial reaction is often, you know, sewn into your DNA. It's okay to, 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 to feel what you feel when things don't go your way. But also, as you sort through the chaos, know that you have the ability to not only tame it, but make something from it, right? Truly so that next time something similar arises, you have a blueprint. You'll be a step ahead, you'll find that perspective. Probably realizing, as I have, that it's just not the end of the world anyway. When you're able to eventually step outside your emotions, operate from a point of clarity, a reshuffling of priorities always seems to take place. Look, the storms will come. And if you're pushing and growing and trying to take risks, right, those storms will be numerous. The question isn't, will you feel them? The question is, can you get a little better each time at not crying out? Can you improve the reaction? Can you regain composure and stay locked in on what truly matters? The other day, I was on a podcast with Evan Carmichael, who's a, a YouTuber and entrepreneur. And we were talking with Shaquille, who was the host, about uh, the mental side of the entrepreneurial journey. How we set goals, uh, but also prepare ourselves for the inevitable adversity associated with growth. And one question Shaquille asked us was, uh, where do we see ourselves in five years? Okay, so... Side note, I have a unique relationship with this question. As someone who was unsure and experimenting with their career, right, for much of their adult life, uh, I never quite knew how to answer it. You know, it's like two things can be true at once. It's a very reasonable question. Uh, but I also uh, didn't like answering it, right? Hated it to my core, you could even say. I could never really articulate why. It just made me uneasy. Right? Like five years is a lifetime. How am I supposed to know? And again, no knock on the host at all. It's a very uh, common and practical question. I'm, I'm glad he asked it because it uh, opened the door to a pretty cool conversation. So anyway, he asked the question and uh, I'm thinking, oh man, like how am I going to approach this? And before I said a word, Evan blurts out, look, if you know exactly what you're going to be doing in five years, you're thinking too small. And that comment, to say it made me happy was an understatement. It was like, thank you for saying what my mind has been trying to piece together for a decade and a half. You know, if you know exactly where you're going to be, of course you're limiting yourself. There's just too much predictability, too much routine process and not enough experimentation, not enough life. Why? Because growth is unpredictable takes us places we didn't expect, shows us things we didn't anticipate, it unveils truths and minor miracles about ourselves that we, let's face it, never would have seen 
had we been dismissive of all life's variability and opportunity. Now, does this mean we don't move with conviction in a general direction? Does it mean we don't have goals or ambitions? No, I certainly don't think it does. Right? You can't hit targets you don't aim for. That will always be true. It merely means life is not about being perfect in bringing about a particular result. It's about making adjustments throughout your pursuit of meaning. If you feel closer to your purpose when you change the medium, then change the medium. If it means, you know, your heart tells you left is where the value lies and not right, then go left, right? To me, it's essentially reminding us that life is not a black and white, yes or no, checklist or test. It's a game and you have to grant yourself the freedom to play. You have to give yourself permission to grow. I think about how much time five years is and how five years ago, I wasn't even thinking about creating media the way I do now with the amazing team of people uh, that helped me. Uh, I wasn't speaking on stages. I hadn't crafted my creative style. I didn't know uh, the people I know now who introduced me to not only new people, but new ideas. These are characters, they're stories, they're opportunities that present themselves only as you immerse yourself in the journey. And I was okay not knowing exactly, but merely moving towards a general direction. The most important decisions were, uh, you know, looking back, not what I said yes to, but what I said no to. As I moved through life experimenting, learning, growing, I was able to craft something that worked for me, not other people. Not what's in books. There's no roadmap. No, it's an experiment. And this is more of the reassurance I would have wanted during those years from an older version of myself. Like, it's okay to not know exactly where you'll be. Just promise yourself this. If it matters to you, you'll find a way to move to it, with it towards it. And if it doesn't, then let it go. Surround yourself with people that lift you up. And if they don't, let them go. You'll hear a lot of talk about the right way to do things, especially in this information age. Those ideas and decisions may have in fact been right, but they also may be wrong for you. Try, test it out, and if not, let it go. The experiment that is your life is the reward. It's a luxury. It's such a beautiful ride. You know, don't box yourself in because of some made up theoretical plan. Don't avoid the path to a new world because ah, I checked my list and this doesn't line up with where I said I'll be February 23rd, 2028. Nah, go live your life. Do your best to exist in that place, the intersection of what you love and what adds value. Let it bend, let it transform, let it teach you things about yourself and the world. There aren't correct ways to live, but I think there certainly are some wrong ways. And that's time spent out of obligation, adhering to a story that means nothing to you. push. See what life gives back. Your footsteps in the aggregate will reveal truths and tell stories you could never have even dreamed up. It's in going that your book is written. And just a friendly reminder, people don't read books for the last page, the ending. No, they read them for that stuff in the middle. Right? The journey. So next time I'm asked what my five-year plan is, I'll probably say same as my 10, 20, and 30-year plan. I don't know. But I can tell you, I won't lose sight of that North Star, the one that calls my name. But at the same time, I won't be afraid to wander into the night dance in the moonlight, even get lost in the shadows from time to time. 
Growth is directly correlated to one's willingness to push forward into the dark. And well, into that darkness we shall go. Use what you have where you are. A friend of mine at one point found himself in his mid-twenties, fighting his way back from what he refers to as a pretty substantial uh, setback that had occurred. He was basically rebuilding his life. Okay, he found himself looking up at uh, an enormous mountain to climb, unsure what he would do for a living, how he would make ends meet, very much lacking direction. And as he pondered, he got a job as a pizza oven repair guy. Learned the ins and outs of the craft as he showed up every day, eyes still focused down the road, still contemplating what would be uh, the best move for his future. And as some time passed, he started to realize he was mastering the very niche craft that he was showing up to do every day, right? Was acquiring a very specific competency and quickly becoming great at it. After a little bit of time, he started thinking, hey, I could branch out on my own here. I could start my own pizza oven repair business. And he did. And after not too long, hired an entire team to work with him then progressed into delivering and installing new ovens all over the country and is currently working on some new technology as well uh, to supplement the install and repair part of the business. The guy's doing incredibly well. And it's interesting because you're having a conversation with him about his success and it's like, how on earth did you find yourself doing what you do? It's so specific. And he'll tell you, you know, he worried, he pondered, he thought about business degrees and career trajectories and all that. But the difference was that he didn't take the moment for granted. He saw the value where he was with what he had. Where, you know, he could have seen it as a bridge job or a a chapter in the story or however you want to describe it. He saw it as an opportunity. He saw the present as the answer. Show up and give everything you have to being great now. Because when you're competent in a craft and ambitious, as he is, that's a scary combo. The world becomes yours. Use what you have where you are. And you will, because of this mantra, see doors unlocked that perhaps you never thought possible. There are pieces around you now that will push you to grow and evolve. The problem is we very often dismiss them. What my friend turned into an empire, a success story, could just as easily have been eh, an obligation while he waited for the world to give him something different. And sure, I think it's important for me to uh, emphasize The point isn't to stay where you are forever if you're unhappy. Of course not. The point is that there's value in aiming to be exceptional at whatever it is you are doing, whatever you are uh, committing to, even if it appears mundane. The point is that so much potential is sown into our day-to-day. It just tends to blend in and not feel important, at least at first glance. You know, doors open for people who are great at what they do. And people who are great at what they do live with a curiosity, consistency, and intensity that others might not. It's amazing how uh, 
when we feel that we are gaining competence in something or excelling in something, it becomes enjoyable. Which highlights the fact that, you know, so often our stagnation is a byproduct of us standing in our own way, choosing not to grow. I mean, I, I can't explain how trivial what I do now felt when I first started in 2014. Sharing my thoughts into a microphone, making little three-minute videos, uploading them to the internet, right? To an audience of my immediate family for zero dollars. You know how dumb my rational brain was trying to convince me that was? You know how easy it would have been to move on and simply look back on that period of time as my little YouTube experiment? But again, there is this strange phenomenon that when you inject yourself into something and vow to get better at it, it lifts you up, it excites you, it brightens your world. I had, as I've talked about uh, so many times, found that intersection of what I love and what adds value to others. And that was everything. And the solution appeared not because you know, I bumped into someone that had some life-changing opportunity for me. It wasn't because I found this shortcut or secret formula. No, I just used what was already sitting in my little apartment on Calm Ave in Boston. It's incredible how often our answers are right where we are. That's why as I've progressed through this journey, I understand balance. I understand the value of, sure, looking at that horizon, having big plans and ambition, but also cherishing the opportunity at our feet now, looking around. Because again and again and again, the opportunity is disguised as triviality, as the stuff we walk right by. Always remember, that there's something around you that can be transformed into opportunity, even if it's small. And if you choose to look for it, you will empower yourself. Everyday things. I can throw off examples for days. The internet, incredible resource, leverage it. Whether it's connecting or sharing or creating or learning. Your day-to-day -day effort. Like my friend with the pizza oven, uh, installation repair company. That world doesn't exist if he doesn't take the little things incredibly seriously. Show up to whatever you do with the tenacity that will propel you to new heights, whether it's in that same field or it carries you over to another. Or utilizing your network. There are people you know today, right now, that could contribute to your momentum. Seek them out. Time. The 30 minute blocks that we deem insignificant or downtime between one event and another. Think of the compounding of turning that into a, you know, a push up session every day or your 30 minute audiobook time. And sure, all of these examples are sort of sporadic, they're contextually different, but they have one very important common theme. And that's opportunity being squeezed out of resources that we already possess. It's instead of uh, walking by the pile of bricks every morning, picking one up at a time and beginning to stack them. I'm a firm believer that the difference maker for so many is not IQ. It's not going to this or that college. It's not your background. It's, did you recognize the opportunities surrounding you? Did you find the value or the excuse? Because both will always exist. And that's what we have to understand. The details around you can be your reason for staying right where you are or for doing the unimaginable. So understand the power of utilizing what you have where you are. Make a point to look for the tools within reach. They say what's trash or junk to one man can be treasure to another. We'll understand that your eyes are capable of seeing both. 
You have to lead them to the value. You have to become comfortable with pausing, letting the emotion subside and asking, how can I win here now with the pieces that are available to me? Because they are available. And if you're willing to pick them up, you can undoubtedly, as Thoreau said, build your castles in the air. Sometimes the moment has a way of appearing bigger than it really is. A facade. Let me explain. There was this kid when I was in first grade. Let's just call him Mike. And what Mike would do was follow us all around the classroom and outside at recess. Would constantly look for reasons to quote unquote, tell the teacher on you. Right, dude was an absolute menace. I'm 35, and I still remember Mike. My buddies and I would be, you know, playing basketball outside. Uh, you know, maybe just learn some awesome four-letter words. Would love to give him a test run, but no, not if Mike was around. Mike would go right to the teacher. And see, we feared Mike because we feared being in trouble. Now, as time passes, yeah, you look back and realize how absolutely ridiculous that is. I want to uh, shake younger me and say, who cares about Mike? Go live your life. He doesn't matter. But the reality is, at the time, he did matter. He mattered a lot because he was the personification of uh, what was most scary to us in the moment. Right? As a child, avoiding being in trouble or time out or whatever it was, uh, seemed to be a big deal. And here's what I think. I think every chapter of life has a mic. Not in the literal sense, but in the sense that there's something we fear, something that consumes our time and attention. Something that's been inflated to a state far greater than it really should have been. That has an impact disproportionate to reality. Because as real as it seems in the moment, a few years down the road, we'll do the usual, you know, shake our head and laugh about the seemingly obvious lack of perspective during that chapter. Hindsight being 2020, we'll be shocked we couldn't see what we eventually came to see. But that's what growth is. It's a good thing. We want to evolve. No one wants to be the same in 10 years, see life the same way in 10 years. But it's also an opportunity to obtain some perspective. To understand that our current fears aren't all we've built them up to be. We just can't see it yet. Unfortunately, the dust has to settle before the picture makes sense. Just like right now, we can't judge the world around us the same way historians will be able to with clarity. That's why I often reference Ronnie Ware's top five regrets of the dying, because it's a list of things people in their final stages of life look back on and say, yeah, that was dumb. Right? It's people who have already walked the path pointing out the metaphorical mics they've encountered along the way, because here's the deal. The root of our stagnation, the root of our frustration, our despair comes down to fear in some capacity. Right, when you dig deep, it's a fear of leaving or staying, a fear of criticism, fear of unknowns, fear of letting down the people we do know. Our demons are manufactured, they're comprised of fear, fear that, sure, we'll eventually laugh and shrug off. But oh, the power in being able to fast forward that sequence to understand that life is too short to be held down by chains of our own making, right? How about laughing in the face of what intimidates you now? Not five years from now, but now. How about looking around and asking yourself what obstacles in your life are Mike-esque? How about breaking our constraints down into what they've always been, 
manageable tasks, simply waiting for us to change the narrative. If you aren't pursuing that which is meaningful, it's most likely because somewhere deep down, fear is holding you back. And that fear is holding you back because let's face it, you've let it in. See, the moment is beautiful. It's powerful. It has everything you need, but it's not bigger than you. It never will be bigger than you. So let's not wait for some arbitrary time in the future to arrive at that conclusion. So much of life comes down to control. Understanding what we cannot control while simultaneously capitalizing and making the most of the things that we can. A constant awareness that's critical to our evolution. Epictetus wrote, we must be at once cautious and courageous. Courageous in what does not depend upon choice. And cautious in what does. And this idea has been shared many, many times in many ways over the centuries. Another of which a lot of folks have heard is the serenity prayer, right? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. But regardless uh, of how it's said and who it's said to, the point is the same. There are things we cannot control that we must find a way to stop exerting ourselves, stop exhausting our energy on. They are, as the saying goes, what they are. These obstacles are immovable. And rather than continue to push and push and push with all our strength and energy, our time is best suited learning to effectively navigate them. And then there exists those things that are in our control. I believe it was The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. He said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, if something cannot be changed, stop thinking about it, right? The future represents anxiety. It's worrying about things that haven't happened yet. The past is essentially depression. It's worrying about things that already happened. We can't do anything about the past or the future. All we have is now. And if it can be changed, then act now in bringing about a desired result. Take that first step, create some semblance of momentum, no matter how small, but to worry about what is behind you or in front of you is actually insanity. I remember loving the simplicity and pointedness of that message. Accept it, eliminate it, or adjust yourself to it. Sometimes it helps when I think about things in metaphors and uh, I tend to do it often. This morning I was drinking coconut water right, of all things, and uh, I was thinking, man, it'd be nice, you know those little pieces of, of coconut that float around in there? I was like, it'd be great if they, <laughs> if they were not in there, right? So I had this idea, just grab a strainer, pour it through the strainer into the glass. I'm leaning over the counter, watching the pieces of coconut collect in the strainer, and I'm just thinking, sort of zoning out, like, imagine if those were my problems, just being separated out of my life, just like that, how nice it would be. 
captured in a little net and then, you know, discarded, thrown away. But, you know, it, it didn't take me long to realize a couple things. One, such an idea would never happen. Life will uh, always have some obstacle to place before us. That's what life does. After all, the word is predicated upon the avoidance of death. It's a struggle and a necessary one. Which leads me to the realization number two. We want hardship. You know, purpose and meaning. They're derived from our willingness to overcome adversity and transform because of it. A life without struggle is a car without wheels. And sure, you might avoid the fender benders, but you're not leaving the garage. Right? So that's a, that's a thumbs down. So I thought, okay, well, what if I slightly adjust that thinking? What if it's a subset of problems that I can remove? That's when it kind of hit me, the opportunity at hand, right? Not the so-called problems, but my thoughts about them. There are the real difference maker here. The negative storytelling that can be removed, pushed through the strainer. Again, not novel or groundbreaking. Like I said a few minutes ago, this idea has been around for thousands of years, but sometimes things land perfectly. Right moment, right time. And I knew what I needed to do was remove the worries and concerns pertaining to the events that I could not change. Yet I exhaust my energy dancing around and around uh, with my thoughts about them. You cannot change the future. You can change right now, which ultimately becomes the future. And there's a difference. I had to, you know, pull that back in. See, I think most of our problems are derived from anger or emotional attachment to the immovable, the unchangeable. One of my favorite sayings is, uh, you can't change the direction of the wind, but you can always adjust your sails. And see, when you remove the self-tormenting you have going on about your past, things you wish you did or didn't do, when you remove the concern that the future won't be exactly what you want it to be, which tends to be where I lean of the two, uh, you're left with one thing, the present, right? Clarity. You have officially empowered yourself because the things you allocate your energy to can be changed, can be made better or adjusted. And that's really what it's all about. You can't change the fact that someone you loved or cared about let you down. But when you dwell on it, you're now giving up the present as well. You're preventing yourself from doing what is required of you now to make your life better. You can't control the fact that uh, your company is reducing its size and your department uh, is being eliminated. You can't control the fact that 8% get accepted to whatever you're applying to. Can't control the fact that you will be criticized for doing the unpopular thing, the thing that you believe to be right. And I say these things not to be a downer. I actually don't think there's anything sad about this. To the contrary. Right now that you've accepted these truths, accepted this as reality, now you can move toward what's best for you. No more dwelling on the unchangeable. No more fighting unwinnable wars. No, it's time to go put yourself in position to conquer whatever mountain is next. By straining out the things that cannot be changed, you are left only with what can. You can't change your company's personnel reduction, but you can find something else, something better out there. You can set the stage for a new journey. You can't increase the acceptance rate, but you can increase your value, go above and beyond, put yourself in position to succeed. And if you don't, they're lost. Continue learning, continue growing, continue moving forward. You can't stop the world's criticism, but you can learn to toughen up emotionally, learn to trust your intuition and decision-making, surround yourself with people you trust who lift you up. 
See, when you stop wasting time and energy on the wrong things, you get the right things. Like Greg McEwen says in Essentialism, it's now what we can acquire, but often what we cut away, removing the things that weigh us down, that we're dragging along with us everywhere we go, they don't need to be there. I say to myself often that I have everything I need. It's there. Some of it's materialized. Some of it exists as a seed that I need to identify and water and nurture, but it's all right here. Which means the problem will never be that I'm incapable. It will never be that I'm not good enough. No, when I'm in the wrong, it's because I've forgotten to see it. I've either become consumed with the wrong things or lost faith in myself to do the right thing. And knowing this has been a gift. It's been tremendous. It's helped me even during the darkest moments to reacquire what matters most. Sometimes it takes hours, sometimes days, even weeks or longer, but I get there. Eventually I arrive and so can you. You have the ability to parse out why you feel the way you do, to categorize the thoughts in your head can I change it? No, okay, gone. And with all that's left begins the journey, the good stuff, the adversity and the problems that will make you who you are. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it will be easy, but I'm saying it will be worth it. And that's critical to understand. Your world is there to maneuver and adjust, to reshape, but its transformation depends on a laser-like focus on that which is malleable. That's saying, do what you can where you are with what you have. It will lead you to exactly where you need to be. Even if you don't trust the road before you, trust yourself to walk down it. What if I fall? The man asks, looking nervously over the edge. Oh, but my friend, a voice responds back. What if you fly? A little quote I heard not too long ago demonstrating our proclivity to maintain, to preserve, to protect, to move away altogether from the risk for fear that we might lose our grip on the status quo. Completely forgetting to think about what life could become if things worked out. Forgetting that life is a game of trade-offs. And to fixate on never losing what you have means forfeiting the possibility. It is that simple. To stay is a refusal to go. We need to constantly reinforce the idea, the truth, that what we aren't doing is a decision. And while we place our energy and efforts on minimizing the falling and the failure, someone else is stepping into it. They're capitalizing on it. Falling again and again and again until they can fly. Because the danger is not in falling, it's in never taking to the sky. It's becoming only a fraction of the person you are capable of becoming with the required sacrifice and courage. It's an understanding that we're not wrong for initially thinking small, playing to not lose, thinking only to protect, protect, protect. That's how human beings arrive out of the factory, right? Stock. And you can thank millennia of evolution for that. You're not weak for being scared. You're not less than for shaking when you stand face to face with the adversity of life. Again, this is what being human is. But what we also possess is the ability to understand these uh, default limitations and transform them. To understand 
being scared of the world around us was incredibly valuable forever ago, right? When we roamed around hunting and gathering, it made sense not to inquire further when there was a shaking in the bushes. It made sense not to rashly run into the cave. It made sense to fear deeply the prospect of being abandoned by your small tribe that was the only reassurance separating you from the vast unknown lurking in the darkness, the wilderness. But anyone listening to this today must also understand that these biological drivers are outdated. The lions in the bushes are no more. The caves are generally metaphorical, and one's quote-unquote tribe should be carefully and methodically chosen, right? Civilization provides that cushion, and what a luxury. So when life pushes back, and it will, and you feel like you're on that ledge, you will want to turn back. Not because you're weak, but because you've forgotten that the voice in your head screaming in fear can't see the upside. It's blind to the possibility. It only sees downside. It only says, hey, this might bring about discomfort. There are things out there you don't know, foreign entities, possibly adversaries. Why would you even contemplate taking that leap? And that's where you step in and provide reassurance. Yeah, things could go wrong, but the wrong steps are one, usually reversible, and two, provide the wisdom that I need. It gives you a chance to inject into the conversation that if things go right, your life changes. That this could be the beginning and that we don't live until the excitement about what life can become if things work out is greater than the fear of what life would regress into if they didn't. Without upside, there's no hope. Without hope, there is no purpose. And as Viktor Frankl has said, life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. We're all operating within the same parameters, same playing field. But the difference is, we have different soundtracks, interpretations, and narratives playing behind our eyes. He may see the world collapsing and spend the rest of his life mourning what is gone, while she may see the same devastation and bring herself to wonder, well, what can I build in its place? What can arise from the wreckage? Same circumstance, different storyline, different result. I often uh, cringe when I hear mindset misinterpreted as this magical thing that becomes reality the second you close your eyes and make a wish. Like the law of attraction, as far as I'm concerned, is not magic. I think this whole song and dance is much simpler than that. We act in accordance to, to the things we believe. And if you believe you're not good enough, if you believe you're not worthy, if you believe more is out of the question, what incentive do you have to change? None. It's much easier to default to hating the world when that's your perspective. But when you can find the discipline, even for a moment, to pause and ask, well, what if things got better? What if my life could be more? That spark has suddenly given you a reason to take another step forward. It's made an argument as to why that discomfort just might be worth it. The magic isn't that you wished for it and so it was. The magic is that you saw it as a possibility and in doing so incentivized yourself to move towards that outcome. It's hard to gravitate towards something that has not yet been built. It's hard to stand with conviction in defense of a life that hasn't yet materialized. But that, my friends, is the beauty and mystery of life. You don't get what you want until you start living like you already have it. Like you can touch it, taste it, like it's real. 
So when the journey feels impossible, know that you are on the right track. You're competing against some very formidable adversaries, your very DNA. You're competing against the people around you that don't understand. You're competing against the obstacles that make you question whether that conjured up castle in the air existing only in your head could ever come to fruition. That is some resistance. But as you step forward into the haze, your single solitary acts of courage will begin to tell a story, to take shape. The once make-believe will become tangible. You'll see the pieces coming together and you'll see yourself as the one capable of assembling them. An architect of sorts, a designer, one with courage and self-belief. The truth is you will never completely mitigate fear. That will be with you forever. It's par for the course. You just need to remember that the power of purpose, of meaning, the value of upside and opportunity is greater than that nagging voice of fear. It's not about closing your eyes to who you are or where you've been. There's beauty in all that. It's merely about opening them to all you can become. One of my favorite quotes is sometimes success is simply hanging on when others would be letting go. The reason is that it reminds me how frequently the advantage is in not stopping. It's in consistency. It's in showing up. When I run particularly long distances, almost like clockwork, I can break it down to feeling good at the beginning, usually a little rough stretch in the middle, and then somewhere in the second half, uh, I catch a second wind or a second blast of energy. The question just becomes, when? Will you hang in long enough to capture it? Because you don't know when it might be where it will show up. You don't know when you'll find that nice rhythm again uh, that makes the sport so enjoyable to me. And when I say, you know, you can pull an infinite amount of life lessons from running, this is one of them. A depiction uh, of trusting that the road ahead has everything you need to cross your finish line. Even when the short-term chaos is all you can see and feel. Even when it's hard to look up and imagine. Right, because it's easier said than done when you're tired and worn down uh, to continue on, right? When you're in the trenches. There's an uncertainty to the road ahead, but each footstep is a shot on target. Each step forward is saying, I'm worn down, but I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. And life can present an almost eerily similar narrative. Whether personally you're at a low point, whether you've been working and working and working and haven't seen the result you're looking for, whether you're uncomfortable and starting to wonder whether this reward is really worth the high price tag. You need to remember that second wind, that second blast of energy, just enough momentum to ease your worry and recalibrate your journey. It's there. It's waiting but you know the rules of life. It won't come to you, you must go to it. Through the storm, into the night, beyond the comforts of home. Most sadly don't arrive. Not because they couldn't, but because they ultimately let go. They look too far down the road at the distance to be traveled and forgot that their only job was to hold on through the doubt, the pain, the worry, no miracle 
just a willingness to fight each battle as it presented itself. To let time stack up, to let the distance over your shoulder accumulate. See, the thing about stopping is that you never know when that much-needed second wind will arrive. There's a saying that many of life's failures had no clue how close they were to success when they gave up, when they turned around. Now, I'm not suggesting the road will be perfect or that it won't come with its adversity, mistakes, and lessons. But what we always have control over is the ability to push forward until we finally come face to face with that which we so desperately needed. It's there. I could say it a million times and it wouldn't be enough. The pieces exist. Will you hang in long enough to collect them? When the road is intimidating, will you hold on? When you run into those moments of self-doubt, will you hold on? When you feel small, navigating the ups and downs of life, will you hold on? Because if the answer is yes, you'll find yourself crossing some finish lines that will blow your mind. You'll get from life that which most can only dream of. And again, not because of the miraculous, but because you knew that the second wind was coming, you knew it would be there for you so long as you kept moving forward. Holding on when most would be letting go. Normality is a paved road. It's comfortable to walk, but no flowers grow. Vincent van Gogh. What is normality? Well, according to the dictionary, normal is the usual, average, or typical state or condition. Common. Normal is also a decision. There's a quote by Robin Sharma, and I've looked to this for years. It states, uh, if you want what the 5% have, you need to be willing to do what only the 5% are willing to do. What they obtain is not, definitionally speaking, normal. It's uncommon. And what they do to arrive at that outcome is also uncommon. They play by a different set of rules, and in doing so, end up with an entirely different outcome than most. To put it simply, we arrive at normal when our effort level is normal. You put in normal hours or give average effort at work, most likely your results, career progress, compensation will be normal. You pay moderate attention to your fitness, your health, well, your level of physical fitness will be normal. You dedicate typical levels of effort to your relationships, your relationships will be Normal, not terrible, but not remarkable. Right? I'm sure you get the, the idea here, the pattern. Generally, over time, what we get starts to reflect what we gave. And here's where the self-assessment comes in, the awareness. You have to ask yourself in pursuit of something greater whether your actions are aligning with your goals and objectives. There's nothing so futile as telling yourself you're going to achieve miraculous, larger-than-life outcomes and then putting in average, typical, normal effort. If normal goes in, normal comes out. And as I was thinking about this recently, you know, as it pertains to my life, I had a little epiphany. Right, so fitness is a big area of focus for me. I run or do some type of strength training six days a week. As far as I can tell, that level of effort is beyond normal, right? I go above and beyond uh, in that area of my life. But even though I'm aligned on my mission to be the 5% there, I realized there was a gap. I realized my diet was very normal, completely unextraordinary. It's just easy to convince yourself to eat whatever you want after a really long run, right? Why not pizza? After all, it's the normal thing to do. 
But I had to remind myself that what I wanted in that area of my life, holistically, is not normal. Therefore, the inputs cannot be normal. It was time to start standing up to those things that are very easy to say yes to, to rationalize. And that's the idea here. I pick my 5% categories where I truly want to excel and make sure there is nothing normal about their development. You want top tier results? You have to give top tier effort. Make the sacrifices, map out the path. You know, I've come to see this differently over the years. It's not an indictment against you as a person for choosing normal. But know that it is indicative of a choice. And the output eventually comes to align with the input. All the actions or lack thereof stack up to resemble something. And it's up to you to decide what that is. And so the next question, perhaps somewhat of an obvious one, is when it comes to the things that matter most to you, why stay confined to normal? It's the above and beyond, the peak experiences, the times we overcame, fought and won, took the risk and came out on top. That's when we are at our best. That's when we get the most from life. So is normal the end of the world? No. It's just that abnormal is the beginning of one. Relax, you're here. That's a clever little sign hanging above the sidewalk right at the border where Pompano Beach turns into Lauderdale by the sea. And as it turns out, that spot is almost directly in the middle of one of my favorite running routes, almost exactly halfway, which at first I found kind of annoying, being that no, I was not where I wanted to be or intended to be, and no, I certainly could not relax. The heat, and the sun and the miles to go always beg to differ, right? False advertising. I was not, in fact, here. After all, here in this context suggests one has arrived. And how can arrival feel like missing pieces and unknowns? How can it feel like so far to go? In the valley of despair, can one really be here? But the more and more I took that route, the more the little sign became a landmark in and of itself. Something that I looked forward to, its own little destination, a point in which I could both look over my shoulder and realize how far I've come, as well as find reassurance for the journey ahead. It was a manufactured pat on the back, a change in narrative. Because here's the deal, it's easy to feel lost in the middle. It just is. It's easy to feel empty-handed after days or months or years. It's easy to fall into the trap of never enough. But if you step back and adjust your perspective, you see it for exactly what it is. A beautiful process. Here doesn't have to be the predetermined destination. Here can be the culmination of all the steps it took you to arrive at the now. Here can be the lessons learned along the way, it can be the reassurance that while you're not done, you've overcome every obstacle up until this point and there's no reason to think you won't continue that pattern moving forward. So relax, you're here. Perhaps here being a place of trust. The ability to look in the mirror 
and sure, see your opportunity areas, but way more importantly, see your brilliance, your tenacity, your courage. After all, when armed with those traits, it doesn't matter where you're dropped off at or placed. There's no finish line that's too far away, no mountaintop that's beyond you. Where you end up in the game of life will be directly correlated to the level of trust you have in yourself to play. So relax. You're here. Maybe here being that point where you can make the leap you've always wanted to make. Where you can feel confident that the unknowns don't stop you, they inspire you. Where you see the past as proof that your limitations exist, only where you decide they do. And here is not a wall or a barrier, but a springboard to the next great adventure. Where you find that spark of inspiration to push against life and see what comes back. To test the waters, ride the wave, that self-identified beginning that lights a fire in your soul. So relax. You're here. Maybe here being the point where you realize you've been selling yourself just a little bit short. Where the image of yourself that you've created in your head is lacking. The metaphorical shoes you've been wearing have been outgrown. And here is where you change them for something that better suits you. Where you make a contract with yourself to endure the growing pains and the discomfort. Where you willingly pick up the pace in exchange for that adrenaline rush associated with leveling up. The excitement of the wind on your face, the increased speed opening up your mind to the realization that you haven't even scratched the surface with regard to your potential. And that alone is a gift. So relax, you're here. Maybe here is a reminder to simply enjoy the now. To stop thinking only about what's down the road and look around. To realize that the future is just a fantasy about what might come. And the past is a retelling of stories that have already occurred. Making your experience on this planet only right now. A culmination of right now is stacking up to comprise your entire life. And while the destination is the purpose that pulls you through, the very idea of a destination is essentially trading a current right now for a future one. So maybe look around and enjoy what you have. Appreciate the moment in all its glory. Relax. You're here. See, whatever here means to you, it's essential that we know, even in the heart of the storm, the chaos of battle mid-journey, that you have everything you need. Not just to survive, but to adjust and re-examine to identify what means the most to you and follow that like your life depends on it. Relax, you are here. Here being the inflection point that separates the past from the future, that cuts your negative self-talk and those self-imposed limitations down to the nothings that they are. For me, that sign and its message have become a reminder of the duality of life. The tightrope that I have to walk between chasing down the dreams that pull me out of bed every morning and simultaneously cherishing the moments that comprise the journey. 
Sure, it's the halfway point of my run, and sure, I have ways to go. Sure, celebrating now would be counterproductive, but breathe in. Look what I get to do. Look where I am. Look what I have. They say we live not for the destination, but the journey, and I think that's right. I think in a way, the finish line might just be the excuse we give in order to experience the steps that take us there. It's the chase, the pursuit, and so relax, you are here, reminds me that I'm in the thick of the good stuff. Ed Helms, at a commencement speech, quotes his character from The Office, Andy Bernard, as saying, I wish there was a way to know you were in the good old days before you've actually left them. Well, this might just be that reminder. Grow to something you've yet to become, but with everything you have, appreciate who you are now. Respect that finish line, but cherish the race. When the time comes and we've reached the end of our days reflecting back, I think there are two successes that I'll identify as I'm reminiscing. First, I don't want to look back and feel regret for a lack of courage. I don't want to wish that I'd been bolder in pursuit of my dreams. No, I want to accomplish the unthinkable, capture the unobtainable. But second, I also don't want, when reflecting back, to realize that I never looked around and enjoyed the ride. That I didn't know what I had the entire time. That when things felt like a lot, I forgot that a lot was in and of itself a gift. So when the pressures of life seem to consume us, the expectations overwhelm us, the story disappoints us. Let's find the time to pause, take a breath and relax because it just might be life's way of telling us that we're here. Sometimes when you don't know where you're going, the best thing to do is go there. A wise man once stated that an object at rest stays at rest. And while his rationale is a little different than mine, I'm gonna borrow from his premise. Right, because when you move, Even if you don't know where you're going, you put yourself on a collision course with something. You put into existence an entity to react to. Some call it destiny. Others call it fate. I call it simply initiative. Because if your journey is hypothetical, you have nothing to celebrate nor correct. A sailboat can adjust its sails once it leaves the harbor, right? It can learn from and manipulate its surroundings, make sure it arrives at a destination, right? It learns and adapts along the way. But from the harbor, it speculates. It expounds upon a path that might be straighter, might be faster, might be more thought out and tied together than the crazy sailors who took off for the horizon. But in actuality, it goes nowhere. In the real world, it is stagnant. And I could be wrong, but I'd make the argument 10 out of 10 times that the real world is where we want our results. And my proof? Well, a journey that started 
uh, with insurance and evolved into music and songwriting and audio production and video production and creative writing, then a sweet spot that kind of combined everything. A spot that didn't make its way to my inbox with an exact address. A spot that required a lot of failure and lessons learned and disappointment, but man, more than that, so much fun. Right, my proof is sitting down right now, in real time, letting my fingers create a bridge from nothing to something of value. By the way, after sitting here staring at a blank screen for hours, it's just starting. Could I be wrong? Could I screw up? Could I wildly miss the mark? Yes. In fact, it happens more than I'd like to admit. But here's the beauty, even if I am wrong, I now have something to work with. Something has been brought into existence. And well, that means I'm officially further along than I once was. And I've heard over and over again that there is no perfect moment, that you have to just go. And the idea, I mean, it makes sense. It's impossible not to understand, but it's one of those things that until you feel it, doesn't mean anything. How can you miss something you've never experienced? Well, to put it in a way that helped me understand, you aren't going because, eh, what do you have to lose? You're going because everything is to be gained. The answers that you pick up along the way, like the little coins you pick up in Super Mario, right? You have to start collecting pieces of a puzzle that you can then arrange. I truly believe that one of the most important ideas we need to hold on to moving forward is personal agency, self-belief. And I say that because I, I feel like I'm watching it slip. There are cases where we literally don't know or understand that it's within our own ability and control to change our lives. No person or group or letter in the mail is going to come along and green light your idea. In fact, you might not even really know what your idea means or how it will look. And that's not only okay, it's amazing. It's the marble that you get to chisel away at to create something. See, life is not the, the perfect execution of a plan. Life is the courage to make your way into a world that no one really understands or knows anything about. I'm not talking physics or biology or quantum mechanics. I'm talking about the real life that is emergent from those areas of study, right? There is no perfect formula for happiness. But it will always be true that immobility or standing still is antithetical to progress. And there is plenty of data that supports the idea progress equals happiness. We want to move towards something. So that's what this is about, right? Here's to not being scared of what we don't know. Because somewhere in the realm of what we don't know exists what we need most. So yeah, stop waiting for the perfect moment. And yes, begin. But not because it's an ultimatum. Do it because the things that make life fun and intriguing and exciting and ultimately worthwhile, they live on the other side of your front door. The little E on the car dashboard reminds me that I'm pointed east. As I sit at the red light, perpendicular to Ocean Ave, staring out at the water, this is it. This is as far as I can go. There are no more streets or towns or cities. There can't be any more stops along the way, just 
miles and miles of ocean. And it's interesting for me to think about all the changes I've made up to now, growing up outside of Los Angeles on the opposite coast, relocating again and again, sometimes very targeted, methodical moves, sometimes just for the sake of change, but always moving, always going. There's a saying that wherever you go, you take yourself with you, right? You can change the scenario, the circumstances, the surroundings, but ultimately you can never outrun yourself. You are accompanying you on whatever journey awaits. And it's often not until you run out of real estate, until there's no more road or options, that you're forced to look in the mirror and acknowledge that it is you who must change. It's you who must evolve and become that person that you need you to become. And that can be a scary thing. After all, anyone can get in a car and head east. Anyone can point the compass away from the chaos of now move away from their demons. But how many of us can find the strength to look those demons in the eye? How many of us can make ourselves bigger than what attempts to weigh us down? All of us can, but how many of us do? Are we running to something or from something? Because there is a difference, and that difference is not small. One of my favorite speakers, Jim Rohn, when referencing our journeys through life, our push to make more of ourselves, he essentially said, it's not what you get at the other end. It's who you become along the way. And I think, like everyone, I've forgotten that from time to time over the years. Forgotten that value is not simply in going, but in becoming. In the courageous little steps that accumulate over time. Forgotten that the external world might inspire or excite. That change might invigorate the soul. That the road untraveled might remind me of life's beauty, but these externalities are only as valuable as you allow them to be. They're only opportunities if you decide them to be so. Change inspires. But will you let it inspire you to do that thing you know you need to do, but are terrified of doing? And that road, it might remind you of life's beauty. But will you let that reminder be your invitation to share your own beauty with the world? Whatever that means for you. Can you be that vulnerable? Can you take that leap in the story of your becoming? See, it is incredibly easy to look out at the world and pinpoint its flaws. All those little problems and imperfections, they tend to jump out at us. But can you identify what you, yourself, need? Can you be courageous enough to ask those questions of yourself? What matters to me? What does a meaningful life look like to me? Where am I falling short? That is a conversation that needs to be had and it needs to be had often. Otherwise, we will drive and drive and drive until we hit water and are forced to ask that question. Because it's interesting that when we don't pause and make the changes that need to be made, life has a way of ensuring that we do. But when it's mandated by life, it tends to be a lot messier, a lot more chaotic, at least than when we make the decision ourselves, but either way, we cannot run forever. Either way, 
We must step into a new pair of shoes and learn to walk confidently with them into the night. There are plenty of little mantras floating around out there, little pieces of advice, and perhaps it's best for us to weigh them each individually, see what meets our needs and fits our criteria. After all, life is not one size fits all. But one of my favorite among these is to do one single thing that scares you every day. And I'll tell you why. Because when we become conditioned to turning our backs on all the uncomfortable things in life, we cripple our prospects of a better tomorrow. It's synonymous with the seed refusing water, saying no to the very thing it needs most. And what should be noted here, one of the reasons it's so dangerous is that saying no is incredibly subtle. It's not some big event or explosion. There's no fireworks show that occurs every time you walk away from what you need. No, it goes unnoticed. And again, one of the greatest challenges is quantifying that which we don't do. How do you measure that thing you walked away from? Well, unfortunately, you can't. You can't, at least until you're staring out at the Atlantic with nowhere to run, no more escaping on the agenda. You don't know until you're forced to pick the pieces up and make something of them. And I say this so that hopefully it can ignite that spark in your soul that you need most, whether you previously recognized it or not. I say this to remind you how much bigger you are than your problems, how you have the ability to transform all that exists around you when you transform yourself. There's a certain inevitability associated with how we see ourselves. And I believe this to be true at both the personal and the societal levels. Anyone can look in the mirror and see the past where they've gone wrong, how inadequate and ill-prepared they are. But the courage to look in the mirror and see strength, to both identify and understand one's shortcomings, but know that you have the power to do something about it. To know that the times you fell or didn't make the cut, they don't indicate that the endeavor was all for naught or unequivocally wrong. No, there is so much good tied into your pursuit. So much beauty and courage ingrained in your soul. But imagine, imagine a life where you no longer run from the gaps, but close them. Imagine finding it in yourself to begin that hero's journey. In where you used to run to protect yourself, now you take the offensive to grow yourself. Where you used to avoid the possibility of failure, now you chase the possibility of victory. You can have that if you want to. You can be that if you choose to. And sure, you may never be able to outrun yourself, but you can always adapt yourself to be that person you always needed you to be. Sometimes we just need the reminder that we are strong enough. We do have what it takes. And that the thing that hurts us most in the short term not only saves us pain in the long term, but it becomes what we live for. It is where we find our meaning. And so perhaps this ocean before me is not there to remind me of my constraints, that I have no road left, but a reminder of just how often we measure using the wrong metrics. Perhaps I needed to see again that it's not where I end up, but who I become along the way. That when the internal self steps into the shoes it's been too intimidated to wear, that when the world within becomes the beacon you need it to be, 
the roads and the stops along the way, they matter a little bit less than the eyes that process it all, that decide what it means, how it will be utilized in the game of life. And so, yes, the little E on the car dashboard, it says that I'm pointed east. But as I sit at this red light, perpendicular to Ocean Ave, staring out at the water, I know this is only the beginning. Hold the vision, but trust the process. An idea that should act as our North Star, right, as we make our way through life, it proposes believing in a goal, but at the same time understanding that its manifestation will be unpredictable, challenging. It may not unfold the way we thought it would. To me, though, the most challenging aspect of personal growth, of building the things that matter, creating realities we dream of, it's the mandatory dance we must do with time. The patience that's woven into the equation, it's the empty spaces that we tend to use for manufacturing doubt and disbelief when life has given us nothing to, to react to. It's like we create monsters in our heads. And it's really an incredible thing when you think about it, right? I look uh, back on the past decade of my life and the hardest parts, and some were excruciating. They were pain derived from what I knew I hadn't yet accomplished. It was a feeling like I wasn't moving fast enough, like the winners in life had that over there and all I had was this over here. A completely nonsensical narrative, but one that certainly felt real. Discomfort from the delta or the gap between what I wanted and what I had. A feeling that would randomly dip in and out of my conscious mind uh, as I sort of chipped away at my goals day in and day out. And I started to wonder, how can I better position myself to grow, to maintain that ambition, but also to do it with less anxiety, right? As I stated a few seconds ago, hold that vision, but perhaps improve my trust and relationship with the process my ability to immerse myself in various pursuits without dwelling on the fact that I hadn't yet arrived. Because look, I know this game. We all know this game. There's always going to be another finish line to cross. That's a great thing, but can also, when we're not looking at it correctly, be to our detriment. There are always higher numbers to achieve. Again, incredible opportunity, but with the wrong perspective, dangerous. If you can't find a way to appreciate the now while you climb, you will be forever lost. There will always be a hole that's never filled. I think we need to be better about supporting ourselves along this journey. No one can be there for me like I can. And I think that's true for everyone. We need to be our greatest ally. So I brought this question up, as I tend to do, with a few of my friends, right, with different perspectives. They look at the world a little differently. 
and basically asked, you know, how can we get out of our own way? Is there a lane to both be tenacious in our pursuit of evolution, to continue doing the things that excite and challenge us, while also being a little easier on ourselves, trusting that dance we do with time as the process unfolds? And so I present this question to, to one of my friends sitting across from me at the table, and he thinks about it. He says, Eddie, well, that's what's gotten you where you are. That feeling like there's always more. It's uh, the reason for the success you've had and the success you'll have in the future. It's what will push you. It's why you will succeed. People that accomplish things are never satisfied. Jordan was never satisfied. He was never happy. And in that context, greatness and happiness are not compatible. And, you know, I, I took it in. I certainly appreciated the perspective, right? In many ways, I think he's right. Sort of reminded me of the idea behind Tim Grover's book, Relentless, that uh, it's an obsession that must take place. It doesn't leave room for much else, right? Incredibly valuable to understand, if anything, just to see, just to grasp what it means to achieve in a world of obstacles. But truthfully, I wasn't um, entirely satisfied. Right? How can we better visualize the process so that we're more powerful allies to ourselves? That's what I wanted to understand. And a short time later, I'm at the kitchen table, kind of going over some analytics for uh, social media, like YouTube channel, podcast, stuff like that. Um, and my father, who happened to fly in from Boston, he's at the kitchen table with me. We're having some coffee. And I made a comment about the trajectory of the numbers. You know, I forget that particular week. Maybe it was higher or lower than expected. I don't really remember. But um, he made this comment about the patience that I've had with the channel over the years. Just an offhand remark. You know, he said, uh, the numbers are like the S&P 500, right? The stock market. There are days when it drops, there are days when it rises, but over the long haul, it's steadily pointed up and it continues to point up. And I found that so interesting. You know, I harp on the small things a lot on this channel, the little breakthroughs that uh, pave the way for larger transformation, ideas that change the way we look at things, which ultimately change the way we act, which change the results we get. And this happened to be one of them. You know, it hit me just right. What is perhaps the most important piece in the famous book, The Intelligent Investor? What is the idea that made Buffett a billionaire? It's that you invest in things you believe in and you remove the emotion. You hold the dips. Right When the stock market takes a hit and everyone's panicking and acting emotionally and selling, you don't sell. You buy more. Right When the world uh, emotionally rushes out, you rush in. And when the world emotionally rushes in, you step out. Well, in life, there will be days when your metaphorical stock drops. At least you feel like it does. Right, those YouTube numbers, perhaps numbers in the old bank account, maybe fitness goals fall flat, maybe you're just not seeing a return on investment. But we are never defined by the events of the day. Even the worst of days, they're merely a small part of a much larger pattern. And the truth is, sometimes success is so small, you can't see it. Of course you're going to be anxious if you think every day should be comprised solely of mountaintops and finish lines, if you're always looking, comparing, contrasting. But sometimes success is 0.00001% better. Sometimes success looks like the S&P 500 taking a hit, dropping for a day, a week, or a month. Sometimes growth doesn't look like what we want growth to look like. But just like intelligent investors, you are putting your money in the belief that at a certain point down the road, the value will be higher then than it is now. And this idea has been everything to me, particularly on the days when it feels like things are going backwards over periods of time where I feel like I've been standing still where the voice in my head 
was presenting all kinds of scenarios that I could have been better or done more, and maybe so. But these times are nothing more than data points. They are steps along the way. And knowing this, it essentially frees me from the delusion that growth is always visible, that I can always look around and, and see visible triumph. Uh, it allows me to march towards my goals and my dreams, having a renewed relationship with each step. You know, there's a saying that we need to keep our head in the clouds and our feet on the ground. Life is a continual juggling of extremes, and I think this gets it right. Our strength is in the ability to take those steps, each one a message to the universe that we are stronger than we were yesterday. But what makes our journeys truly divine is that they aren't comprised of or built with those steps like a house of cards, where one wrong move or, or some delay will cause the whole thing to fall, to come crashing down. No, what makes the journey divine is the infinite number of paths that can bring about its materialization. There are no wrong paths. Some arrive sooner, some arrive later. Some mid-journey you know, cause us to realize that the compass wasn't even pointed in the right destination, right? They, they change what it means to arrive. But the point is, every step is required, every step is a miracle, but the power is not contained solely in one step but rather what we choose to make of all the steps combined. The dips, the lows, and the losses only have significance if we give them significance. Otherwise, they're just a few stops along the way to something beautiful. So why exhaust energy on data points that haven't arrived yet, on destinations in the future? Destinations that we trust ourselves to figure out anyway. Our emphasis should be on the present moment, on gratitude for the fact that we get to wake up and choose the pursuits that we've chosen. In some days, those pursuits will feel like the miracles that they are. We'll see the finish lines, the mountaintops, we'll feel triumphant. And some days, those victories will be hidden in plain view, but they are there nonetheless as we make our way into the great unknown that is life, piecing each second, each minute, each hour together to become the path leading us where we need to be most. Everyone wants to be great. Everyone wants to be the best, the top, the 1%. Or as the saying goes, everyone wants to be a beast until it's time to do what beasts do. See, what life has revealed and continues to emphasize is that our most vital decisions they present themselves in the dark of night. The chaos of the battle, they show up amidst our discomfort. We know these moments. The ones that seek to stop us in our tracks and turn us around. They are what must be prepared for. They are the gateway to excellence. So let's look at the big picture for a minute. Life in totality because consistently doing the simple, easy things, they're important. Consistency of that which is simple is the foundation. It's what we build the structure upon, but it is far from everything. Moving right along, we have the difficult things that push us to be more, that show us who we are, that hurt, that test us, the temporary storms, they are the armor we come to wear. They're what prepares us to endure the trials and tribulations of life like a muscle that must be grown and developed. But the difficult things 
or far from everything. Because lastly, we have our defining moments. The moments that put it all together. When the sky feels like it's falling, the body feels like it's failing, the mind feels like it's dwindling. Presenting the question, will you do the hard thing when you feel like you can't do the hard thing? It's doing what's difficult when the situation around you is screaming at the top of its lungs. You've gone too far. You've separated from normalcy. You are wandering into something that can no longer be deemed predictable or safe. See, running is hard. But running when you're tired, when you didn't get a great sleep last night, you don't feel good, when you're busy, when your schedule's full, when you have things to do, when you're in the midst of your workout and your lungs are screaming for air, the cloud of pain is hovering over you as you make your way forward for no other reason than you told yourself you would. That's not hard, that's transformative. Going to the gym is hard. But going to the gym when you don't want to, when you don't even feel like stepping into the car, when your mind is trying to rationalize a day off, when you're asking yourself what the point was to begin with, that's not hard. That's transformative. Growing your business is hard. But growing your business when you've experienced a monumental letdown, when you went all in and were left empty handed, when you were chewed up and spit back out, yet you showed up, kept your eyes locked in on that win, that's not hard, that is transformative. See, these monumental moments, the ones that break so many of us, that we've all come face to face with over the course of our lives, they're not about easy versus hard. They're about doing the hard thing when it seems as though you cannot do the hard thing. The world is saying no. Your body is saying no. That chirping in your head is saying no. Can you separate yourself from that hurt and that anger and that disappointment? Can you segment the negativity knowing that you will do what you can to remedy the situation? but that life's curveballs can't stop you from moving forward for the simple reason that you won't let them. When life gets hard, you have to be harder. The one who gets bolder. You have to learn to surprise yourself. Here is what I believe to be the goal, the pinnacle. It's what I aspire to become. When life puts me through hell, to dig deep and find the emotional IQ, the awareness, to know that right now is the invitation I've been longing for, my chance to level up. See, you might be wondering what brought this concept to the forefront of my mind. And well, it was one of life's inevitable setbacks. And I had to look in the mirror and say, I'm not going to think about the technical issues that just cost me thousands of dollars and thousands of hours of my time. No, I'm going to one, learn, but put parameters in place so it never happens again, and two, find the opportunity. See, when we build back, we tend to build back stronger, clean slate, new lease on life. Where can I be better than I was? Where can I pinpoint and capitalize on the value I once walked right by? When we adopt this mentality, we become unstoppable. Someone on the outside looking in might say it's over the top, and it is. But so are the things that I want. They might say it's not that simple, correct. Running away from our problems is simple. I'm not about that life. They might say it's impossible to do all the time, to think that way every day, and perhaps so. 
But if we bow our heads and retreat every time life isn't perfect, we'll never attempt anything. I'm not aiming for perfection, I'm aiming for progress. Those who aim for perfection tend to spend the entirety of their lives doing exactly that, aiming, planning, speculating. Wanting more for yourself means receiving more rejection from the world. It means elongated valleys of despair. It means deeper treks through the heart of the vast unknown across distant lands and through turbulent waters. It means doing the hard thing when the circumstances are what mere mortals call impossible. At some point, we must transcend the versions of ourselves we once were. We must recategorize and redefine the adversity we face in life. Be the ones who find something where others see nothing. Find value in the seemingly valueless. Let us start from the premonition that there is always a solution. And if there is always a solution, there is always a way to bring it to existence. Some will stop at easy, fine, let them. Some will stop at hard, great, to each their own. But if one dares to push further, to trudge forth into the night, they will be tasked with doing the hard thing when the circumstances are devastating. They will be asked not just to sail the ship, but to sail it through the storm, to not just build the tower, but to build as the skies open up, the wind blows and the ground shakes. That will be the difference that has always been the difference. So what will you do when the time arises? Who will you choose to become? In his play, Measure for Measure, Shakespeare wrote in 1603 uh, a line that I think adequately sums up the reason so many of us fall short of what we are capable of becoming. He wrote, our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. Our greatest tragedies and regrets in life tend not to be our mistakes. They're not when we try and we falter. No, the vast majority of the time they arise when we do not even attempt. Because fear has prevented that very first step. It's when we have that perpetual light shined on all that can go wrong while the upside and the opportunity sits in the dark, just out of frame. And in a world where you get what you focus on, to only focus on the worst possible outcome, it's a death sentence. It's debilitating. The way I see it, there are a million ways to improve something. There are infinite roads and paths and possibilities. None are certain, but what is? Here's the interesting thing, though. The only certainty, the only thing that is for sure is that if you don't go, you will not arrive. One will never finish what they do not start. Listen to this quote from Thoreau. It's from his book, Walden, uh, which he wrote after about two years and two months of living in the woods by Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts. He wrote, I learned this, at least, by my experiment, 
that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dream and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. He will put some things behind, will pass an invisible boundary. New, universal, and more liberal laws will begin to establish themselves around and within him. Or the old laws be expanded and interpreted in his favor in a more liberal sense. In other words, the world does not dictate, it reacts. It becomes what we decide it will be. And I was thinking about this recently. Uh, have you ever thought about the utility of water? Just water. And how it is obviously essential for life. Specifically, humans can't live longer than uh, about three days without it. Yet, we can also very easily drown in too much of it. The same thing that's required for life can easily take life away. It all depends on how it's being utilized. And so when I think about this, my mind goes to Shakespeare's message on our doubts making us traitors if we let them. Or Thoreau's passage about moving with conviction towards the things that matter, towards our dreams. And what I see is an intentional restructuring of the world around us. The idea that life can work for us or work against us. It can be our headwind or our tailwind. The reason we stay or the reason we leave. And who decides that? You. You decide that. I often think back to my first creative project once I, I took the entrepreneurial route years and years back. Uh, I referred to the project as quiet desperation in reference to actually another Thoreau quote, most men lead lives of quiet desperation um, because I realized around that time how easily that could become reality and decided to do something about it. For me, it was a huge step out of the routine and the cycle. I finally finally ask myself who I was living for. Where did I lose myself? Or had I simply never bothered to find myself? And I don't know the answer to that, but I know at the time, if you asked me, you know, Eddie, what are you truly excited about? It'd probably be a lot easier for me to tell you about the things I didn't like, I was afraid of, that I was unhappy with. That's what I saw, that's what I focused on, and that's the point. Until then, I was immersed in Thoreau's dreaded common hour thinking, and so used to it that I thought nothing of it. There was no next step or other side. And then I arrived at that moment, that moment I hope we all get to at some point. Realizing there's very little to lose and everything to gain. And it drives me crazy how hard we have to fight for this understanding. How much easier life would be if it was intuitive, but it's not. It's a journey, a muscle that must be built, and so we must build. We have to prove to ourselves that what's big and intimidating can be broken down. That what we visualize can materialize. That will always be true. But we, we need to make ourselves believe it. Identity is scripted, confidence is earned, not once, but every day. And we must understand the pain associated with staying far exceeds the pain associated with moving towards our dreams. The former is destructive and the latter is what we need. They are not the same. So being as we choose what we see, how about a commitment? Not a commitment to be perfect, not a commitment to have all the answers or avoid mistakes. No, how about a commitment to allow ourselves the courage to be imperfect, 
A commitment to go when we don't have the answers. A commitment to see mistakes as a necessity instead of a catastrophe. In this world of subjectivity, make sure that movie playing in your head illuminates the opportunity, not the loss. So that when you fall, the inclination isn't to run from the bad, but to look for the good. Because I promise you, you will get what you look for. That perspective will alter your actions, which will alter how you see yourself, which will alter the trajectory of your life. Let's leave that mediocrity, that common hour thinking behind as we head for higher ground. Commonality, being average, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It seems simpler. Sure, it seems easier. But the ones immersed in that world, they're depriving themselves of the answers they desperately need. They're refusing the hand that is perpetually reaching out. When we turn our backs on the extraordinary, it is because fear has gripped the wheel and we are now passengers along for the ride. But you have the ability to be more. You have the ability to move towards what matters to you. To take the steps one at a time, bear the discomfort one second at a time, acclimate one day at a time. This is a journey dependent entirely on you and your willingness to step out the front door. To finally see the things you previously disregarded. And when your eyes open, you'll see that you can be your ally or your enemy. This can be the beginning of a new chapter or the continuation of a current one. This is your story. And by the way, that doesn't mean others wouldn't love to make it theirs. Wouldn't love to tell you that life is beyond your control. Wouldn't love for you to think that you are dependent on the outside world, that you need them and what they are willing to provide for you. But no, this is about you. Understanding that the first step starts with you your decision, that your autonomy is a strength and a chance to begin again. Change the way you think and what you get changes. It's not magic, but practical evolution. When we force ourselves to see the positive, when we look for a way, we find it. That's reality changing because you decided that it should. And that's what the power of perception is. Nothing more than unlocking the gate that was previously placed before you. There's no better time than this very moment to walk through it and rewrite your story as it should be written.